Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Spencer Lodge podcast in partnership with the incredible Najahi events. If you don't follow Najahi, go check out our sponsor, Najahi Tribe. And if you want to learn to grow and be better, then go to that website and go and learn something. There's great courses there. There's stuff you can learn from social media to business to well-being to spiritualism. There's stuff for you there. So go to Najahi Tribe. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited to have my next guest on this show. You've no idea how exciting it is. (laughs) A man that went to prison for 22 years for a crime he didn't commit and to have the positive spirit and mindset that he has right now is just messing with my head like you wouldn't believe but a pleasure and a joy nick yaris welcome to the show thank you and i really am grateful spencer this matters so much man i think go ahead go you talk you speak 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 okay i think the most relevant thing right now is I feel really good and purposeful that my past experience of being in solitary confinement is really helping people in real time with this lockdown. So many people's lives are in stasis. So many people's lives have been put on hold just like they're in a cell. And they feel this pounding in their chest of that fear of being just like on death row. And The analogy is we truly are, every one of us living under a death sentence, we never know when it's coming. And for us, we're trying to find the beauty within us right now that matters. And we're trying to expound it and and have meaning in our days so much. And that's why it's so important right now that we keep doing this. It's so wonderful that here I am sitting on the coast of Oregon early in the morning, My children have just awoke, and here you are around the globe in the evening, and the same feelings between us are shared many miles apart, and that's what's now growing, and that's wonderful. I love it that this chance that I'm given right now to talk to people gives everything that I went through so much more validity, so much more balance. It was a dark time in my life. It was a hard time in my life, but I persevered by doing the one thing that mattered. I didn't give up on my humanity. Okay. For the people that don't know you, let's tell the story. You're a young guy. You've, there's, there's lots of stories of young kids that go through challenges. There's lots of stories of young kids that, that have battles and, and go off the rails and, and become destructive and as many as there are stories of kids that that have a tough time in it and it leads them to great early parts of their career as much as it as kids that have tough time that end up going into the military because that's a place for them to be able to find some form of structure discipline and and a sense of belonging tell everyone about what it was like being a teenager for you i grew up in philadelphia pennsylvania in the early 60s in 1968 we had a tumultuous year. It, if you think 2018 was bad, imagine Robert F. Kennedy is assassinated the same year as Martin Luther King Jr. Wow. Rioting, rioting all across my country. Race relations at their poorest. Schools in turmoil. Everyone full of fear and anger. And I was just a little boy in Philadelphia. And my story was easily overshadowed by all of that. I was just one of the many children who went through the worst experiences with a sexual predator. Someone who saw me alone in the woods with my dog and attacked me, left me with mental scarring. But I exacerbated the situation, as you know it, Spencer. I kept it a secret. I did drugs to hide and mask my embarrassment, and then I furthered my own poor behavior on top of it, leading me to a life of petty crime and indignant behavior all throughout my adolescence. To the point that I ended up getting stopped 
in a stolen car, high on drugs, and falsely accused of the attempted murder of a police officer. At that point in my life, 20 years old, a drug addicted a person, no one truly would have given me the benefit of doubt of me having not done that. And I fell into that belief so much that I then furthered my own misery by trying to make up a scandalous lie about a murder I knew nothing about to try and barter for my own petty freedom. And this one act undid my whole entire life because I ended up destroying any chance of being believed about the first crime that I was falsely accused of by making up a silly lie. It went in all of the worst ways from there because I didn't have faith in the judicial system, but a jury of my peers found me not guilty of all the charges against that police officer from my initial arrest. But by then, I had already been charged with the rape and murder of a woman I never met because of my stupid lie in which I tried to barter my way out of my original charges by making up a falsity about a man I, I hated. My own anger ruined any chances I had for fair, fairness in the courts. I was given a three-day murder trial in 1982 for the rape and murder of Linda May Craig a woman who lived in my area, a mother who was working over the Christmas holidays to earn money for her family and her children then. And it was terrible that I endured the humiliation of watching my family be destroyed in front of my face in that courtroom. I was taunted and belittled and made out to be a perverse, psychiatrically tormented person who would go out and kill a stranger. And this hurt me so much that I became an embittered ball of anger. So much so, I would repeatedly beat my head on a wall every day just to stop the memories of what I was. I really endured the hardest of it when people mocked mocked me because I couldn't speak. My only real hope was, if I have to die in this misery, God, please find a way to give me a voice so that on the day that they execute me, I can tell them how much I love them and forgive them and how beautiful I really was. And that began it all, Spencer. A man killed himself on my block. I was in the hardest prison in America and the guards were taking me past his cell to take me to treat me for the wounds on the back of my head from beating my head on the wall. The guard looked into the cell on the way back and he told me, you go in them cell, get them books, you read them and maybe you won't be so angry. I didn't know it. But one of the treasures that came out of those five books that I picked up was Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. His beautiful words were written while his entire family died of tuberculosis in the 1920s. This treasure became my touchstone because when my mind cleared, and I found the beauty of his words and the story of Al Mustafa the Chosen within this book. I felt so akin to the soul, this tortured person who would spend years within a walled city. And may I have the grace, the wisdom, and the knowledge that when people asked me about my experiences, I could tell them who I was as he did. And Spencer, I went on this journey, man, like they beat me for talking. They beat me for trying to be human. And at first I was bitter. For their own amusement, they used to put me in the cage and make me fight other human beings and beat them up. I have to live with the fact that I was gifted at hurting other human beings. 
And it's a terrible feeling inside to know I'm a beast. I'm an animal. And I had to do it for the sake of not being reduced to mush. I lived in chaos and I got to a point where I had to make a decision. Either I fight for my humanity and I stop fighting other men or I give up. After a brief, ex oh, it's crazy to explain this part, but in 1985, four years into this hell, I escaped from death row. I was on the run for 25 days and I turned myself back in. The beating that I endured for running away, my head up, man. They broke all my teeth, shattered my face. I couldn't look at me. I couldn't bring myself to see who I was. I took a photograph off my wall that was the one of me as a young man. I put it up there alone after taking all the others down. And I used that photograph to speak politely to this person, knowing that it was my only chance of survival was to believe in this person now, the one that they had broken the one that they had mocked, the one that no one believed in, I was going to raise up and make him incredibly strong. But how? How do I do it? So, I began by helping others. I found men with broken minds and I wrote beautiful letters to their mothers. I pretended to be them. I wrote nice stories about them and made their mothers or parents or caregivers, whoever they wanted me to write a letter to, to really feel good about their child. And it became a blessing. I then started doing legal work for other men. I helped men get off death row. I became confident and strong. I met a woman from the outside. I fell in love. I did all this incredible thing of growing. I, I, I think it goes back to this point. After the beating, I kept thinking about the words they were saying. One of them was, God forgives the Christian in me for doing this to you like that you know so I read all of the world's religions in a three-year period I wanted to I wanted to really have respect for anyone who believed and I wanted to understand them so I went through this really deep thing and when I finished this three-year period reading all of the world's religions I was given a gift a newspaper that was being thrown away was given to me. And I found out about DNA testing. And at that moment, I became the first man in history to ask for DNA testing to prove my innocence from death row. It was like, that was my reward for respected Muslims, Hindu, Shinto, Native American. I don't care what your beliefs are. I read about you. I love you. I believe that you are right to have a sense of purpose in your prayers. I believe that you are right to want good, and I respect you. I didn't know that was the beginning of 15 years of fighting for DNA testing, man. I didn't know I would have to ask to be executed to get it done. But I knew if I survived it, God was going to bless me. God was going to give me that voice that I didn't need 
to tell everybody I forgive you for killing me. God gave me a voice to say, you can heal if you love yourself. You can be a good person no matter what's been done to you. And Sp Spencer, you're good if you want to be. You really are. And that's it, man. Wow. When you fell in love, did, did you feel like you were free to fall in love at that time? Did you think you were allowed to fall in love? I was horrified by the aspect that I was going to take on the burden of caring for someone outside so much that they would make me vulnerable. The weakest vulnerabilities are our trust and love in others. Imagine the burden of opening yourself up to someone after the guards just beat your face in. After you've been made to beat other human beings until you're covered in their blood while guards laughed and cheered. I felt so dirty. So at first when I met this woman, Jackie, who I eventually did marry while I was still in prison, I refused to tell her I was actually innocent. Why do that to somebody? Why tell them the biggest hurtful thing they could want to know about you for the sake of your own ego. What, you, you get them to feel pity and mercy for you? Get them to feel all of that pain so that you can draw somebody else in on it? Nah, man, I kept my mouth shut at first. How, talk to me about hope and faith because it would be very easy, and I'm sure for many it does, and I couldn't possibly try and put myself in that place, but it, could, it must be very easy to lose all hope. You talk about silence in the prison. It's the first time I'd ever heard about there being silence. I'd always heard that you had to obviously follow rules and all that kind of stuff, but I didn't, I didn't think about silence. And the way you describe silence to me was so loud. So brutal. Yeah, it's a weapon. Imagine that the one thing that's kept you going all throughout your life has been the cooing sound of a human voice. Sorry, it's cold in this room and I had to cover my bald head, Spencer. That was it, man. <laughs> but The penitentiary system in America was devised in, in Philadelphia. And part of the tenets initially was that you would enter a room and stay silent in penance for what you did wrong. Many generations later, they figured out that was a great form of torture. Without the human voice, we die inside. So the first two years that I spent in solitary confinement, no one spoke on that block. You got a good old ass whooping if you opened up your mouth. And it was terrible when you heard somebody snap and they start screaming. They can't take it no more. They just start talking. So four guards dressed up in uh, riot protective gear rush into your cell. They pin you to the floor after beating you down. And then a nurse wearing a flak jacket and a helmet runs into the cell holding a giant needle and she stabs you in the ass with a thousand milligrams of drugs. And that's it, you're gone. You get this white drool coming out of your mouth for days and your hands shake because they've over medicated you. And it's terrible, man. I, I oh, oh. Everything tastes like medicine in your mouth. And if that doesn't work, stage two. 
four men come back in that cell, beat you up. The nurse jabs you in the ass again, but this time they drag you out and they put you in a special cell made of glass bricks. The lights left on 24 hours a day. And if you don't get up for head count every 15 minutes, they come in and beat you. This is all documented. And this is crazy. Huntington State Prison in Huntington, Pennsylvania had active practices of torture every day as a routine. There was no death row, and this is where I landed at the age of 21. The average rate of survival was five years on this block, and I lasted 12. I were watched you, 11, go ahead. Were you, were you in the same cell, in the same block for all that time, or did they move you around? I was moved around. I was, uh, after I got a, a back injury, they put me on the bottom tier. And I was really grateful for that because when the riot happened and they set the buildings on fire, I felt like at least I would be one of the last ones killed. The guards, they ran off and left the block empty. They told us, fuck you, you're going to die. 225 men began screaming in, in agony and pain and, and fear. Like, they didn't care. They were going to let us burn. Then they got control of the prison again, and they came back in and beat us all up. So, hoorah. Let's, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about hope. Let's talk about. I don't know the hope team. Don't get me started on that one, boy. See, you think hope is an emotion. Or hope is a longing. It's neither of these things. Hope is your connection to your dreams. Hope is the train that you board, never knowing when the stop is. Wanting it to be the destination that you long for, praying it takes you there without bumps. You wait for the next passenger to get on and hope that their energy doesn't ruin your hope. You've paid your fare. It's written all over your face. You really don't want this to go badly. And you never really want to invest much in the ticket, do you? You hate paying the fare. But the hope train goes on. My hope train went on for 15 years of the DNA efforts I made, man. I got on the hope train in 1988, and it ended in 2004. I couldn't believe it, man. I was... I watched a hundred men get on the, the train with me and get off. The DNA came through for them. And still, I sat rotting, waiting. Oh, 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 hold on. You were the first one to go for DNA testing. But you... And I watched a hundred men go free before me. I didn't know that bit. Yeah, because they cheated me out of DNA testing for 15 years, man. Why? And during because they knew I was innocent and they knew that I caught them red-handed destroying the evidence. So the federal court stepped in twice. When I found new evidence, they would go and destroy that. I had the only case in, in American history in which all of the autopsy material was destroyed. Thank God I'm clever, man. Thank God I'm clever. I found them out. So take me to the day that you finally found out that you were, you were, you were going to be free. How, many, how much in time in advance did you know you were going to be free from actually coming out of the jail? Oh, I knew I was going free a year before anybody else knew it. They just didn't want to acknowledge it. So it went like this. Like Monday the 12th of January 2004, they took me down to the processing unit and took my photograph for an ID. That identification would be allowed for me to take out of the prison and get on an airplane and go home to my family 400 miles away in Philadelphia. On Tuesday, I packed all my belongings and sent them home. I was told I was going home that day. 
of course it was the 13th of January, I wasn't going anywhere. On Wednesday, my mother had a photograph of herself taken holding a portrait of me in her home asking, where's my son? Because I was supposed to be released. Coincidentally, my older brother was hit by an automobile that night while he was drunkenly crossing the road in front of my parents' house. So on Thursday, the 15th of January, 2004, my parents were in the hospital waiting for me to be signed out of prison, but it never came. At 5 p.m. that day, they let me out of my cell, let me walk around the block and say goodbye to everybody. And then 20 minutes later, they came and said there was a mistake. Get your ass back in the cell. On the 16th, Friday, January, I can't believe this. 7.30 in the morning, I get up, they wake me up, they take me to the processing unit, and they put me in a van with my little box of letters and stuff I have with me, and they all say goodbye to me, and we start driving out the gates. I drive out around the prison, all the way out through the first set of gates. Everybody's waving to me. It's a hero's parade, and we get up to the last barriers, and the guard says, no, he ain't getting out. Take him back right now. The guard driving the van refused to put the vehicle in drive further. He put the vehicle in reverse and reversed all the way through the entire prison, right back to the administration building where I was, to re-meet all of the officials who said, look, it's not us. We're not playing games with you. Your attorney is on an airplane in Florida right now, go into the state capitol to get your paperwork there released because of your escape in 1985. Just give us a few hours and we'll let you go. And I asked them, what about my parents who were standing outside the gates? They said, well, we told your parents what's happening. They're over. They're going to be taken to a restaurant nearby and given some food. And they can wait in, in there instead of standing in the cold. There's hundreds of press outside the prison. So, I go back and I wait. And of course, one o'clock comes, 1300 hours, and the doors open, and they all come in with paperwork, and they want me to sign this paperwork, or they're not going to let me go. But I said to them, you're telling me, if I don't sign this agreement, you're not going to let me go. And they said, please don't do this to us, Mr. Yeris, just sign the paper. So I signed the paper and I stole the ring pen and put it in my pocket secretly. And then I walked out of the prison then and I began fighting for Walter Ograd, a dude that I met in there. Like I wasn't going to stand there and cry about what they did to me. I didn't give it to him. So what? And it's amazing because I realized I was going to start the biggest battle of my life right then and there. No one believed that. No one understood that. I still had hepatitis C in my system. I still was expected to have to have a liver transplant when I was kicked out of prison. I had no money, no resources, no health care, no job training, no job history, Nowhere to live but my parents' basement where my little brother had died two years earlier of a drug overdose. And from those meager beginnings, I started kicking ass like you wouldn't believe, Matt. I went about it like an actual soldier. I used my wit to not only answer what they did to me, but I began fighting for others. And I really put in the effort, man. Within 10 months of my release, I was standing underneath the portrait of Margaret Thatcher in the lower house of commons in parliament in London, delivering the best speech of my life. 10 months only free. I'm sorry, I have some workmen working next door and I know you can hear that in the background and I do apologize. We can't, we can't hear anything, mate. We can't hear anything. Genuinely, can't hear anything. Good. And the, all right, so Spencer. I used my education to rebuild everything 
of my life with nothing more than kindness. You talk about the kindness diaries. I got out and everyone is in now thinking this fucking guy's crazy. No one could survive 23 years in a cell every day being tortured. And he's got to be nuts. He has to be broken. He has to be damaged. And yet, I wasn't. I was so well adapted at keeping my humanity on death row that it shined brightly when I got out. All those good deeds that I did, all my niceness, all my kindness gave me the navigational tools to live again. I didn't understand it. I didn't know it. Look, this is where it comes from. My mom sat me down, man. She looked me in the face and she said, I've been thinking about this all night, Nikki. You need to sit down and listen to this. For you to get out of prison and not be a nice person is a waste of everyone's time. It's a waste of every one of my prayers and tears, honey. Please do me a favor. Be a nice man. Be a polite man. Because if you can do that for me, then I can feel like we can show respect for this family, for what we are. I didn't know that was my mandate in life to become a superhero. See, in the meticulous politeness of my efforts to be nice to people is a reward system in my brain called neuroplasticity healing. And it makes me not function poorly. It makes me not suffer from PTSD. It makes me have an ability to go out on stage in front of thousands and perform. It gives me the gregarious charisma, the hold the room captive. Want to know how I did it? By being nice. Gosh, that's just so profound. <laughs> do you think, Nick, that having, when you came out of prison, having other people to focus on, that the people you wanted to help, having like the opportunity to to get your mind into trying to solve their problems really, really helped you adjust? Yeah, because I kept my empathy gene alive. Yeah. And that's what drew you to me. Whether you know it or not, studies have shown, well, when they had mass gatherings in the past, hmm. they went and did DNA genealogy testing for groups that gathered like X Games and Goths and stuff like this. And invariably they all shared genetic traits yeah so the truth is we are drawn to each other by our empathy team those who have the empathy team really exude this care that is drawing all of this feeling from others and those of us that do it well really reciprocate it over and over and that's a wonderful thing that i kept alive because I was able to fall in love and be married to a woman and give those feelings of love. I'm a great husband now to my wife. Because I was able to care for people who were childlike, I'm a great parent. Because I harnessed those feelings again and again, regardless of my own situation, I gave myself the ability to still keep those feelings alive. One, one, of, one, one, of our, one of our audience members once has mentioned your mum and said that your mum sounds like an awesome woman. Tell me, a bit, tell me a bit about your mum because she went through a lot, didn't she? Yeah, Harriet Jane Yaris was her full name. And she went by Janie. She wrote thousands of letters for me. Uh, she welcomed Jackie into my life as an ally to help with my DNA efforts. She did all of those things in piety while she watched her family be ripped apart. My, fa my father lost many job opportunities. My brother was actually working for the Philadelphia Police Department when I was arrested as a holster for their horses. And when I was convicted, he was thrown off the job. 
my family endured all of the torment and society of people calling her up in the middle of the night and telling her that she was the mother of a monster. My mother endured all of that, but never once defended herself. She would always tell me, Nikki, I'll never defend myself. I know who I am, but I'll never let anyone say a lie about you. To my dying day, know this. I fed you and I clothed you. I was there the evening of the murder, sharing a meal with you. If I thought you killed that woman, I would pull, pull the switch myself. I would kill you. But I looked you in the eyes the night of the murder and I know you didn't do this. So boy, don't you let me down. Stand up, you be a man. So that was Jane. That was my buddy. She would drive five hours to come see me and they would give her 15 lousy minutes. And every time I would do my best to give her the most amazing 15 minutes of me happy. I never once did this. She didn't see this. Mm -mm. In fact, one day she came unannounced and she saw my hands bandage and cuts all over me. And she said, boy, what are you doing? I said, mom, I had to fight. And she said, no, you don't. I said, but if I don't, there's consequences. She said, well, you deal with the consequences because that's better than losing your soul. You don't get in here. And what if you kill one of these men? You're never coming home to me. We have enough troubles right now. She said, unless it's a matter of life and death, I don't want to see your hands like that again. Don't come to me with scars on your face and tell me you needed to fight. So from 1989 until I got out, I put my hands down. And it was hard because I got stabbed and everything, man. So I found out a lot about myself, Spencer. I love who I am. You know, a lot of people have a difficulty saying that. I truly love who I am because I'm willing to be nice to me. That is so hard for people to do. And if you can't be nice to yourself, how the f can you be nice to someone else? How can you care about the people? While you inside internalize and you're angry and you're nasty, it shows. And that's why your love's broken. Your relationships are hard. Because you don't love yourself. You don't respect yourself. I'll never go back to that. I lived that way. The best feeling I have in my life right now is knowing that somehow I'm built for this, man. Like, I grew up in the hardest city in Philadelphia, and I survived it. All my friends are dead. I survived death row for 23 years. I survived 16 years of freedom. Whew. And yet, I'm thriving because I'm right. I'm using kindness. I'm being polite. I'm being humble. I have no ego. I live humbly. I don't live in a mansion. I, I, I really am a down-to-earth person. And that, that came through with this meaning to me. I'm living my own message, man. Spencer, I swear to God to you, man. I don't care who you talk to in the future. I'll never let you down because I'm living my message, man. Every day, I'm living this message. <sighs> it's my daughter's birthday. I haven't seen her in six years, man. Seven. Jesus Christ. I married a girl from England when I first got out. We had a baby together and it turned ugly. And sometimes in life, a parent can poisonously use a child's separation as a weapon of uh, anger. On April 16th, 2006, Laura Rebecca Yaris was born at 10.26 a.m. in Watford General Hospital. 
her heart stopped. The water had broke two days before, but Watford General was booked up and we had no way to get a bed. They did an emergency C-section, man. Oh my God, when she came to life, I was so blessed. That's another reason I'll never be angry. Because even though I live my life in freedom, and I live with the terrible stigma that a lot of parents do of having a child stolen from you. If I ever get angry, I ain't, I ain't never coming back, man. I ain't ever coming back if I ever get angry. I refuse to do that. I'm gonna see her again. I didn't do anything but marry the wrong person. That doesn't mean that I should suffer the loss of a person in my life who's my blood, but I do. I feel and you. Even though I, feel I, do, you. I hear you. I, I feel you. I, I know exactly how that feels. How long right, since you saw her? Six years. Yeah, the last time I saw her, I was allowed to go to a McDonald's and buy her a McDonald's and sit in a McDonald's with her while her mother berated my partner at a table nearby, cast castigating me and telling that person what a horrible person I was. That was my barter. People think death row is tough. It's a lot harder out here, man. Tell me about how life is for you today. Tell me about a day in your life, what you, what you do, what you represent and that, and how you, with your incredible courage and spirit and, empathy and kindness how you impact the lives of others or go about that well as big as my story is you think i i finally just told a new part of it monsters and madmen imagine everything you know about me spencer and i kept a bigger one quieter yep the whole everything you know about me is superseded by a story called monsters and madmen what happened at the end of my death row journey in Huntington Prison. See, they closed that unit down finally by lawsuit. So they had a decision to make. What do we do with all of the cannibals and serial killers? We can't let them out for eight hours a day unsupervised. No, 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 we're gonna have to figure out a plan. Well, that plan turned out to be 48 men sent to Pittsburgh Penitentiary and put in a special psychiatric experiment. And for three years, I had one guard try to murder me by having other prisoners do it for him. That's how crazy it was. Tell me more. I had a guy on my block who was a geriatric serial killer. He karate chopped all these old ladies to death. Some of them was old as 86 years old, man. Whoa. He, was a, oh. he was a piece of work, a chameleon. He wasn't big and threatening. He was just evil, man. This guard, remote control, opened his door while I was in a shower, vulnerable. He came into the shower with a razor blade and began slicing at me, trying to cut my throat. It was, uh, it was a good two minute fight, man. I was hyperventilating at the end. We were wrapped up in this plastic sheeting from the shower curtain. And I was panicking because I couldn't get my hand on his hands. They finally pushed the panic button. The guards came in and started beating on everybody. I was like, oh my God, thank you. Like, oh, wow. I still get, I hate it. I hate the feel of the razor. Ooh, Spencer, that's a bad one, man. It's, it's uh, it burns. Mm. In the end, I let him crush my hand in a metal door so I could get out of there. Imagine that. I let him crush my left hand in a metal door so bad they couldn't put handcuffs on me knowing that they would see the damage and he had to do an investigation 
and I got traded to another prison for that incident. And that's why I ended up meeting my friend, Walter Ograd, and helping him. Crazy. How many people do you think, when you look back on what you've done, how many, how many prisoners have you, have you helped and fought for? Oh, I got, I got four men off of death row. I got three out of, three out of prison. And I'm waiting on my friend, Walter Ograd, who spent 28 years on death row for a crime he didn't commit. And the mother of the victim knows he's innocent and is calling for his release. The only person holding this up is the judge who was the prosecutor who put him on death row to begin with, not signing the release order. The district attorney has called for his release. The mother of the victim calls for his release. The DNA evidence proves his innocent nothing matters 16 years of my life i've been fighting for this man I mean, so that's what i've been doing oh I mean, you asked me about my days oh by the way this is really important for those of you struggling with cove vd knockdown you have to recreate structure in your life where you're going to go through the doldrums and anger and you're going to not do well those of us with the biggest ego are going to suffer the most. Get it together. Create structure like my wife and I are doing for these kids. Have a routine. Clean. Use the cleaning as your exercise. You don't need a gym. I want to teach online courses to show everybody the beautiful yoga that I learned with a washcloth. I gave myself this beautiful, incredible body by cleaning my cell with a simple washcloth every day. You don't need- While anything. you're on that subject, Nick, let me just get a couple of people that are listening. They've got a couple of questions around that, okay? So how, how, how you, you would know this better than anyone, okay? And for anyone that's complaining right now about being under some form of lockdown, then you have no idea. Um, but Brian says, Nick, thanks so much for sharing your story with us. How can we stay motivated and positive during that lockdown in, in uh, quarantine? Because you gotta care about others, man. You now have a duty. You have people that you know that would feel better today by you sending them jokes, you telling them how much you love them, how much you care about them. And by doing that, the neuroplasticity healing in your brain keeps going. Brilliant question, and we need to keep doing that because that right now is so important. People need to hear from you. Just like I needed to hear his words and it reinvigorates the messaging to me. So that's what we need to do. And structure like i said spencer it is so important that we recognize that we are creatures of habit we need to create structure throughout the day or we're going to go mad the hardest things that i witnessed on death row was the stasis of life meaning there's very little new sensory input from memories of your interactions with others this is going to psychologically put a lot of people's heads. All right, here's, your, here's what you need to do. One, you need to do social media to its utmost good, sharing with people you care about directly your feelings so that your brain keeps active. I need you to keep praying because that's part of neuroplasticity. I need you to listen to music, interact with pets. I need you to absorb the beauty around you if that's possible. Meanwhile, have a structure to your day and set goals for yourself because unlike anything you've ever experienced before, you need to falsify. I hate to say it. You have to falsify new memories. Make them because if you don't, you're going to go into the doldrums. That's step one. From the doldrums, you go into anger. Step two into anger goes the resentment and the resentment always leads to this downfall of your health people really need to recognize one thing if you want to survive this be healthy the best way to be healthy is be nice be kind and be open because your brain is helping your immune system stay active period man wow let me just make sure we get these questions coming through here. Mandy says, Nick, what's life like for you now? 
And what makes you happy now? Um, really, life for me has been this rewarding, uh, I guess, you know that feeling you get when you were right about something all along? Yeah. Yeah. But it's not a, it's not that braggartity feeling. It's not that boastful feeling. It's that confidence feeling. I was right all along in making myself pliable to being able every day to do a consistent good. I don't feel at a loss by being at home because over the last, especially since Rogan's podcast, when I did Joe Rogan. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I've helped thousands of people not kill themselves by simply making the effort from my home every day. You get it? Yeah. So, yeah, like I've been doing this on this vibe, I guess I'm calling it. Be consistent, keep giving, keep trying to put it out there because when you start shutting it down and making it about you, people won't ever come back. So I've been doing this consistency at home. The life for me is the same. Um, I get messages. I wish I could post it on here, but I got a really lovely message today from a person who heard the podcast three years ago and how much their life changed for their interactions with me. Okay. I got another message today of all days from a pen pal in Australia who used to write to me while I was on death row and in real time remembered when I was getting out and where I was going to go live and all that. Her name's Melanie Brown. I have a friend in Peru I just reconnected with. So this is for me staying constant, making the effort. I know I have to take care of the kids in the house and do my chores, but make the effort to stay consistently you. Do you know what I mean? Mm, so yeah, definitely. I, get, I get it. Yeah. So before we finish, because I don't want to take too much of your time, and I know that I'm very conscious that I've taken over an hour, and it's, I, I could honestly spend the next three or four hours talking, and so um, that's not good for you and probably not good for my wife either. But I'd hate to interrupt you again, and I do apologize. But you do know someone's going to reach out to you who's been absolutely ripped apart, and we're going to have to answer them. So maybe, why don't we just tell them, hold on for a minute, and we'll come back and do this again. Let's give it a week or two. Would you be, Let's happy, have a happy, to, would you be happy to do that? It's important that I, Spencer, you are such a gift to me. It's important that I do this because if I'm not able to consistently do this, then I just lied throughout this whole interview. And yes, consistency matters. All right. So to anyone catching this first podcast with anyone, we don't need the grisly details of your pain, but we know you're suffering and you're hurting from shit that has never been resolved, right? And what we talked about, Spencer and I, has probably brought a lot of this up. And you're trying maybe to think, maybe I need to deal with this now while things are chaotic. Okay. Come back to us. Let us have a chance and you have a chance to think of how you would most politely have this dealt with. And give us a chance to maybe touch on that subject. Whatever it is, man. And then we'll come back in a week and see how it goes, yeah? How epic is that? Let's end it there and get it done again in a week's time. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've really enjoyed it. If you've got questions for Nick, please send them to me and I'll make sure that we furnish him with them next week when we go again. I'm blown away. I knew this was going to be the best interview I'd ever done. I knew this was going to be the best episode of my podcast. And now I get two opportunities to do it. Nick. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for your humility. Thank you for your love and your kindness. I will be eternally grateful and I will look forward to getting you back on the show in a week's time. Stay Thank safe. You, man. Yeah, listen, and Spencer, in, in the meantime, realize something, man. You today, whether you recognize, because you keep giving me so much praise, you gave the introduction to so many of your friends, you gave people a chance to stop and listen. This is your gift. So as much as you give me the plentitudes and all that, I need you to own it, boy. I need you to also own it because people will listen more when you live your lesson and you, and you really do own it, all right? Good man.
All right. I will see you in a week's time. Thank you so see much. In a week's time, uh, Captain. Bye, everyone. Care. Thank you. Thank bye, you. Bye, bye, bye. Take care. Bye, buddy. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.